hello, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's webinar series for 2012. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Bridges to Prosperity, and our guest presenter is Avery Vang. My name is Carolyn Phillips, and I will be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the Society of Women Engineers, where I am an elected trustee and an appointed SWE ambassador to E4C. I'd like to take, take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Building Upon Failure. One of E4C's topical focus areas is structures, and we're particularly concerned with capturing and sharing lessons learned. So we're particularly glad to have the opportunity to address the issue of failure today. To do so, we've invited today's presenter, Avery Bang, who is the Executive Director of Bridges to Prosperity, to talk about some of the work that her organization has been doing. Avery, we thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series, Anna Aranda of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, and Alex Torres of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering this webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series, please be encouraged to contact them via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we hand things over to our presenter for today, we thought it would be a good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change, or E4C, and who we are. E4C is a global community of now over 12,000 technically-minded individuals, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas faced around the world today. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies like EWB USA, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, plus academic supporters like MIT's D-Lab, international development agencies like USAID and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it is free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org to learn more and sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars page, engineeringforchange.org. E4C's next webinar, webinar will be on January 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Practical Action and Bosch Siemens on the topic of indoor air pollution and smoke hoods, lessons from Nepal. Our presenters will be Sam Shiroff and Dr. Liz Bates. To register, please visit the E4C webinars page. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. Is from today. In the chat window, please type your location.
Any technical questions or administrative problems should go also go in the chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to Holly Oriana. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat window to type in your questions for the presenter. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. If that does not work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, or PDH, for this session, please provide your full name and date you completed the webinar, as well as the code we will give you at the end of the session. Please send this to EAD CEU admin at IEEE.org. Today's presenter is Avery Bang. Avery is Executive Director of Bridges to Prosperity, an international nonprofit organization that focuses on being a depository and training center for low-cost, robust, long-span bridge for rural applications. She is also a lecturer at the University of Colorado in the Mortensen Center in Engineering for Developing Communities. Avery spoke at TEDx Boulder, was a keynote speaker at AFBI Annual Convention, the SEAOI Midwest Bridge Conference, and the D80 Conference at Michigan Technological University, and has spoken at many other conferences and events, including International Bridge Conference, ASCE's International Conference, the International EWB Conference, among others. She was selected as one of American Society of Civil Engineers' Fresh Faces in 2011, recognized in the top 10 civil engineers under 30, and was an invited guest editorialist for ASCE's Structure Magazine. Avery completed a graduate degree in geotechnical engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her graduate research was conducted with Engineers Without Borders founder Bernard Amadi, which consisted of appropriate geotechnical survey and design for low-tech applications. I will now turn it over to Avery to present. Thanks, Carolyn. Can you guys all hear me okay? Um, type in the session chat box if you cannot. Uh, but I really want to appreciate and thank uh, E4C for the invitation to to talk with everyone this morning. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit off of my typical Bridges to Prosperity rural infrastructure a topic and talk a little bit about what I like to think is a dirty F word, that failure um, that so many of us in the development sector, I think, uh, for some one reason or the other, are a little bit averse to. I'm going to talk a bit about how Bridges to Prosperity fails every day. And as an organization, what we're trying to do to learn from those failures. A big part of that key to success is really addressing what technology and innovation for transparency can provide to learning from our mistakes and failures. Um, and I'm going to try to wrap this up by a quarter till, uh, by just some of my looking forward recommendations for addressing both success and failure. So reality check. <laughs> Projects certainly succeed. Projects fail. But I think at the end of the day, our successes are reported on, and very often our failures are the ones that are filed away. Development projects are often in this niche where we have a separation between our beneficiaries and our donors. And I think, unfortunately, oftentimes failures are the things that are a failure to our beneficiary, but not necessarily a failure to our donors. And in that discrepancy, we really run into quite a few problems. So what is failure? Um, for us, the obvious the situation, we have a bridge fall down. But our failures include shipments getting stuck in customs, technologies that break before an intended design life, organizations that allow mission drift, programs that prove inappropriate for a community, and even budgeting and scheduling oversight are all realities, I believe, of everyday existence of a nonprofit organization. But all of us experience failure in one way or the other. 
thought I'd pull in a, a quick example of Thomas Edison. Um, and although Bridges Presser does not work in point of use product development, um, I take a lot of inspiration from the story of how many iterations that he personally took in order to invent the light bulb. And you know, as the story goes, um, you know, it took him over a thousand attempts. Uh, and his fellow engineers out there, I know there's a lot of counters that this story is real or not, but that's not so much my point. It's in that first attempt, if he would have not learned from the mistakes and moved forward and really embraced the challenges and the progress that he developed through each of those steps, um, we wouldn't be sitting in this room today with certainly all the electronics moving about, or maybe not so quickly. So why is it such a dirty F word, uh, this failure? It's, first of all, most important for me to consider, where is this that we work? We are working in some of the world's most difficult places to get to, with the least amount of access, and with the most number of variables. And for us as a sector not to address failure and admit that we're having daily failures, to me, is, is um, quite contrary. Because if you look at even the cultures of many for-profit companies and certainly cultures within industries like Silicon Valley, failure is often seen as something that is indicative of success, where it's those companies that are pushing the boundaries and taking risks and failing and learning from those failures that are really succeeding and creating an ROI for the investors. Sorry about this uh, little question popping up too soon. Um, but I think what we're trying to do and right now with Bridges Prosperity is not learn or not to repeat other people's mistakes. And I think across the sector we all have the potential to do the same. And a big reason that we as an organization are big supporters of E4C is this is exactly the mission that Engineering for Change is here to support. It's this transparency and resource sharing uh, to ensure that we really are learning from one another's experiences. So I'm going to do my first little question and try to get some participation from the audience. But I'm posing a question. Do you believe that the development sector's lack of transparency about our failures is due to poor donor reactions or donor education? Um, so you need to go into your uh, little bar chart, and it's a red, green, blue panel, middle of the attendees above chat, and either say yes or no. Or tell me at the same time if I'm going too fast or too slow. Well, as everyone gets to that, um, I would argue in a, in a large way the donor base is in our particular size of an organization, which is much smaller than many of those folks that get bilateral, multinational um, kinds of support, is generally risk averse. You know, there is this desire to have maximum impact, and with good reason, but in my opinion, the social sector innovates far less and hides our failures on this proverbial rug, largely in due to the fact that the general donor base, again, exclusively discussing uh, smaller donors and foundations, largely does not hear in a general vocabulary what it means to fail. And organizations that are pushing that envelope to talk about their failure currently are not yet being recognized as having a step up in the industry. So to tell you a little bit about my background, and the kinds of failures that we experience every day. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bridges to Prosperity. Uh, we currently have projects in 14 countries around the world. Um, just finished our 100th project this last summer. And the challenges of working in Ethiopia are starkly different than working in Peru, uh, which conversely are starkly different from working in Haiti. And as many of you know that have experienced this firsthand, if we don't learn from each of our individual programs, just within our own organization, uh, we're bound to certainly repeat our failures, even though these environments are starkly different. And the why footbridges question uh, comes up often. In rural areas where many of us are working, that simple lack of access really is a debilitating factor. Oftentimes there are routes that can get to schools, to markets, or to health clinics, but with a river in the way, 
It's only during low water season where crossing is really viable. But in many cases, we're finding that bridges are being built with local technologies and certainly with local organizations, perhaps without say, an expertise in bridge engineering. And oftentimes these structures are failing. What Bridges Prosperity is aimed at doing is providing that simple access. We got our start here in 2001. Um, you see the picture in the lower left is a multi-arch span bridge over the Blue Nile in um, the highlands of Ethiopia. And as you can see, the only way to cross was to get six of your best friends and to hold tightly to this rope. And as you can imagine, the nearest crossing is over a day's hike, either up or down river. You're getting your goods to, to market, sending your child past the fourth grade to school, or getting the health care services that you need that are not readily available right in your own community is a huge challenge and certainly one that has put a roof on the development of some of the communities on the east side of the Nile. Our founder, Ken Frank, came in and helped design and build a simple supported steel truss structure to span that, that arch. And for the first time since 1938 when that arch had failed, there was safe access across the Nile. But this is perhaps the root of why I'm here today. B2P started as a failure. That very first bridge that we built was washed away within the second rainy season. Leaving technical details aside, we did not have account for the high water level of today as opposed to the high water level of the 1400s when the Portuguese first built this bridge. And despite what this low water photo shows, the water actually crests over the top of this multi-arch span every year. So we had a difficult question. What is it that we owe that community of Gondar and Gojam? The donors have already received their pretty pictures and their success story, and certainly infrastructure in the area in which we work is intended to be there for decades. So just two years later, what is our responsibility back to the community and certainly back to the donors? As an organization, we took a tough choice and said, we're going back. We made that promise to try to get access for the amount of time that we promised it, not just to build a bridge. And this particular structure is a 95-meter cable-suspended bridge that had to be lifted up into the gorge to avoid that water level. So I think it really catapulted the prosperity into the direction of being very honest and open about our failures which we have many of. You know, why footbridges is we improve access, so we improve commerce, and traffic re-navigates in alignment with where many of our bridges are being put. We are not a single solution by any means, but just the same way that all of us in your own respective countries, in your own respective towns, largely rely on the infrastructure to get from one place to the other, Road infrastructure and bridge infrastructure is essential and critical in order for other programs and other initiatives to be effective. If you go and build a school on one side of the river where only 40% of the population can reach it, is that really the most effective use of donor funds? As an organization, uh, we focus on building to educate, building to innovate, and building to inspire. But in the spirit of building to innovate and talking about failure, I'm going to focus on this one primary area this afternoon. I personally believe innovation stems from failure. A few lessons learned. Uh, our focus on a program or project scope is at the core essence of everything that we do. We believe that if we focus on doing one thing and doing that one thing very well, even if we're geographically spread, we're allowing our experiences to be shared amongst groups and amongst others. We have, uh, improved ability, I believe, to process and support and train the trained local folks. So when we have a staff in country, we have the huge benefit of focusing on one type of technology that we're able to go back through for our quality control and quality assurance programs and ensure that those folks are following that verbatim. If we diversify our portfolio and work in as many geographic areas as we do, 
we simply would not have the capacity to give the amount of support, both in training and in back end, to those people that we work with. And the last part is I believe that by having a single point of focus, our monitoring and evaluation program is more possible, both because it's more scalable and because we have consistency of intended income outcomes. Excuse me. We have that ability, say, up to 100 plus projects around the world, each in very different geographic environments and each in very different cultural contexts. How are we failing and how are we succeeding in building this infrastructure? The result, I believe, is an increased improvement quality and an improvement in impact. We have construction processes, best practices. We have quality assurance program that is pervasive both throughout our organization, as many of you um, who may be with engineers without borders. Uh, most every bridge project that EWB takes on has some sort of overlap with bridges to prosperity whether that be with our QA program and actually submitting and being verified as a Bridges to Prosperity verified structure, or whether just using our recommended quality control checks. The result, I believe we've come up with some pretty incredible structures. Um, this particular one in Santa Lucia, Nicaragua, uh, is a relatively short span. Uh, it's only 65 meters, but the skeleton of our design has been developed individually in each and every country where we've worked. Local materials are certainly different in Ethiopia or in Indonesia than they are here, but to be able to have that skeleton of design and really that resource for engineers and contractors to be able to replicate these structures around the world is essential. As I promised, uh, Bridges Prosperity fails every day, and I'm here to talk about that. You can see through these three photos um, something of the design iterations throughout the years. On the far left, um, what we thought back in Denver home office was a great idea turned out to be quite the nightmare um, when being implemented in Honduras. We were thinking, oh, well, you know, we've got towers that need to be erected. What is the most locally available material? Our program staff in Honduras, you know, hey, we see these telephone poles everywhere. Oh, it's great. Let's, let's try it out. The reality is, although it's difficult to see in this photo, each of these sets of towers is four telephone poles. So where did you see one on the front side on the left and one on the front side on the right? That exact structure is replicated immediately behind it. So it's actually two and two on this side, two and two on the far. So for those of you that are in construction or built anything, you can imagine how difficult it would be to erect this bridge structure of solid wood, of four pylons, with only pulleys and scaffolding. Needless to say, during the construction process, there was a slip and one of the towers fell. No one was hurt. It was certainly an incident, although not an accident. But as an organization, we had to come back to the board and say, what is it that we are learning from this experience? Are we going to hide this? under a rug and file it into a report, or are we going to make this known that other folks out there building bridges need to learn from this mistake and from this failure? And as you see, off to the right, we've really moved into the direction of highly encouraging steel pylons or reinforced masonry. Won't go into the details of those particular designs, but for many reasons, those are also locally viable and certainly cost-effective alternative to what we initially thought was a great solution. Our method of being able to get that word out is to put everything that we do into open source, free, downloadable resources. If you visit our website, we have over 600 pages of different design and construction and pieces of advice and manuals, quality assurance, quality control, maintenance, monitoring. And to us, the number one contribution that we could have in the world of development is to make ourselves a tool for other organizations doing this work. Which brings me up to the innovation piece. I believe a website should be a hub. I believe E4C is doing this in a way that very few other organizations are doing it. 
saying that let's have a resource pool where we are learning from one another. Let's take this opportunity to use technology to have everyone from engineers to our borders to bridges to prosperity to international development enterprises put up on your website what it is that you're doing, where are you succeeding, and perhaps more interestingly, where are you failing? And I believe if we as a, as a sector agree to push the envelope, we're going to slowly be able to make positive change. I believe that handheld device data collection has made an, a huge impact, certainly, on the uh, ability uh, to get survey data and to, to reduce the human error that I believe has really been difficult, especially in household surveys. We talked about that. Talk about geospatial surveying and reporting and how that's impacted the way that this website and open source approach to transparency. Database-driven results and analysis, also on the website. And I'm going to wrap up with a bit about remote monitoring. I would be amiss not to give Water for People an immense amount of credit in this particular area. Uh, out of the first three things that I believe are pushing the way that this sector is moving relative to being open and transparent, Water for People has really been the organization that I believe has pushed us most quickly and has led from the front. They use handheld data collection, so phones and devices with GPS units and cameras and custom adaptive surveys have completely erased their manual survey process that used to be paper and pencil. Um, just the data input alone improves their efficiency and I believe reduces their error considerably. With the AccuFlow um, platform, We'll talk about more in a second. Um, I believe they're one of the first to use a web-based dashboard where both users and operators are able to analyze how that structure or that piece of infrastructure is behaving and what kinds of technical difficulties, perhaps, um, that piece of equipment might be having. Um, they're also a kind of positive impact. And they're also one of the first organizations to use visual map-based reporting. For those of you that have not exposed yourself to the incredible potential of um, programs like ArcGIS and Arc Catalog, I highly recommend you do so. Um, take a class, do some research, pick up the program. Uh, the opportunity to use geospatial referencing and to figure out where it is that we're working and what kinds of other services have a geographic proximity to those particular services is incredible. Um, using the Bridges Prosperity example, being able to go in and plot not only where is our potential bridge site going to be, but to overlap that with census data and to say where are the schools and where are the markets and where are we expecting this traffic flow to really move um, on the predictive and, and also on the back end. Does that change over years? Being able to take snapshots of a community um, as we have done in, in the one particular area in El Salvador, we were able to see progressive change in a matter of three years, just from the Google, using geospatial referencing and the Google Earth snapshot. And these are all tools that I believe Water for People has really led the way in developing. Promise to show a little bit of this map, but if you go to their website, which I highly recommend you do, albeit they are still in beta phase, you're able to go in and zoom on your country of interest in your region of particular um, interest and see not only what are the projects that Water for People has done, but what are the other water projects that other folks have also put up. Um, and again, they're the first to admit they're still in data phase, but as you, you flip through their website, one of the most interesting things is the number of water points that have come in as a red X admitting their own failure directly on their website. They don't have someone going through and saying, oh, I think that's a failure or that's a positive back in their office in Denver. That's information coming directly from the field. And I'm sure Ned Breslin, as their CEO, has to think very long and hard. Do you want the world to know about your failures? 
and I believe strongly he does, and as do I. Uh, Bridges to Prosperity has, I would say, followed in Water for People's leadership, and we also have a geospatially referenced website, and you can go to our project and find out what we're doing, and also which projects our partner is doing. Oh, bummer. Okay, well, sorry, guys. I think in transition from my Macintosh to the PC platform, uh, you can't see these nice little graphics. But it's a zoom on of the Bridges to Prosperity website. And on our website, this particular project I wanted to show gives us information about the community, gives us the data surrounding how the structure is performing, and most interestingly, it's giving us information and data on who has crossed that bridge at what time. So perhaps, I can correct it, not who, but how many people have crossed that bridge at what time. Um, and the key for us is to be able to go through and see the tread line. If I'm seeing 50 people crossing per hour on average, but at 8 or 8.30 a.m. and again at 3 or 3.30 p.m., I'm seeing a spike and there's 200 people, and we overlap that with data showing an increase in school attendance during the rainy season. We have an incredible amount of information that infers that this bridge has provided increased access to schools. And it's not with remote monitoring alone that can really improve and show what the impact of our, our work is, is doing, but I do believe that it's something that is data, data verification and adds that open source transparency web-based platform that is very difficult when you do manual surveys alone. So Bridges of Prosperity is currently working with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions at Portland State University uh, with their Sweet Lab, which is a center for water and environmental engineering technologies. Um, and they have developed sensors that Water for People are using, Charity Water, uh, Mercy Corps, um, Vester Guard, Del Agua, um, in sectors far beyond infrastructure, in water devices, in latrines, in indoor stoves, in all sorts of different kinds of point of use technologies, they are really a leader in the field to figure out how to monitor data and to get that data directly to you via your computer. And one of the most interesting things for us is that they're very willing to develop different types of technologies to work with us. Uh, we had an infrared proximity sensor and a pyroelectric heat sensor uh, that were embedded in our bridge. And first of all, a little red light, you can imagine what happened, is we came back six months later and there was a stick that had been stabbed into the hole to get the little red light. <laughs> that was what we considered a failure, one to learn from. Uh, the heat sensor, really interesting. It able, it's able to tell you in the gradation of heat that you expect a human being to have. So your 97 to 99 degree threshold indicates a human is crossing that, that bridge, whereas something that perhaps a bit higher or a bit lower may indicate a horse or a bike, for that matter, or uh, a goat. And we ended up going with the slab sensors because they're most easily integrated. But what makes their program so unique is that they're being able to put this data directly into a device that communicates via the cellular network. The only thing you replace is a SIM card, so there's certainly a cost involved in that. But that information is coming directly through a text file in through the cell network back into our, into our um, computer system and producing these graphs that I wish I could have showed you um, onto our website in real time. Well, I lied. Not real time. We only up, update our servers every, every day, but it could be on real time. And that ability to do cloud-based computation is, is immense. You reduce the amount of overhead, the administration to go in and say, hey, is the structure working or is it not? It's straight into your website with red marker flyers saying, you have a problem, your structure is not being used or even manual overrides where you're able to have information come in from the same sensor to tell additional information about your structure. I'd like to reiterate that this certainly is not a replacement for expert surveys and impact analysis right there at the community level. 
But the way that sweet data and sweet prints like to think of themselves as an additional verification and perhaps more consistent ability to monitor your, the impact of your technologies and your program. So as I'm saying, you're being able to be more transparent both to your donors and educating that donor base and also to your own staff. We've found projects that largely are not used during eight months of the year when in our survey before we decided to take on the project, we expected there to be fairly heavy traffic year round. And being able to take those questions back to your staff level and certainly to your supporters, I believe opens this entire envelope of a Pandora's box of questions, which is healthy on a lot of levels. So I'm going to wrap up with the need to address both our success and our failures. I, for one, believe that our donor base needs to be educated. And they're very educated and certainly a well-versed community in general, but that is exactly why we should leverage education and transparency. And the folks that are going out of their way to support many of the projects that I do and that all of you do are motivated and invested in that final impact. But they've just not been given the right information and they're not given enough information to know the reality of how many failures we really are having and who to support and who not to support um, or what projects within that organization not to support. I believe websites really should be open windows. We have no reason to have a website be a big, flashy excuse for saying this is why we're so great. I know that there has to be, you know, I'm sure development directors out there would kick me for saying this, but at the end of the day, your work needs to prove itself. And a website, I think, is a perfect opportunity to do that. There are websites. Um, World Bank hosted a sale fair here in D.C. a few weeks ago. Um, that was specifically targeted towards IT and mobile technologies. But having conferences and websites that are available um, to put up your own failures and have those discussions. Admitting Failure is another great one put out by a group in Canada um, who also produces a, an annual failure report along with their annual report, which I just love. Um, so utilize those spaces. And I believe also collaboration between groups and organizations. So are we able to, first of all, go to these websites and even E4T has a great platform for this discussion around your technologies. But are we going back and using that as a center for platform? I think that we also have to have open arms and open doors between organizations. It can't just be online, and it can't just be with single case studies. I think that as a sector, we really need to invest in having these fail fairs, or whatever you would like to call them, on a more frequent basis, and certainly in a more honest and open environment. And I think that conferences and shared space is a really big opportunity for us to do those sorts of things. Um, I'm going to use the last few minutes to do a, a selfish sales pitch for what we have going on in Denver right now. But International Development Enterprises, um, IDE, has really led the way in developing um, the Denver Center for International Development. Um, this is a building that we currently are working on right there in downtown Denver in an area that um, I believe is going to have a huge impact both on the Denver community, but hopefully also in the world of engineering practitioners uh, who are working overseas. Um, I didn't have time, of course, to show you the video, but I've included a, a link to watch the D90 Center launch video that was um, first shown at the IDE luncheon uh, this last two weeks ago when Bill Clinton actually came to inaugurate the building. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting about this particular center is although we already have 27 organizations uh, that will be based out of that center, including Engineers Without Borders and IDE and Bridges to Prosperity, um, there's also space in the future for this to really integrate when, with E4C's community. Uh, we do intend to have webinars. We do intend to have in-person conferences. We do intend to really try to be the center core hub for pushing around ideas um, and also about lessons learned and failures. 
Uh, and I really believe that that is something that is difficult. You know, we are going to be going into a space where we are learning from one another, but we're also sitting right next door to who traditionally has been our competitors. When I'm going to a donor, oftentimes they're asking, why would I give to you? And that's the guy in the cubicle next door. And I think it takes a lot of honesty and transparency on everyone's behalf to sit into this room and into this building and push ourselves and say, well, let's make everyone be better. So I invite you, and I really hope that you watch that launch video. And if anyone has questions about the center, I'd be more than happy to address those um, during the Q&A session as well. Um, the last piece is, and most important to me, is I believe that the feedback loop within our own organization is really the catalyst for change. I think this has to come from leadership. If you guys are with organizations, ask your leaders. How are we failing? How are we learning from those failures? Be honest about your own personal failures. You know, I, I got a call from, you know, let's say, my, my guy at East Timor being like, Avery, you give me the most ridiculous schedule. And for this, 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 all these reasons. And if I don't have the ability to take that criticism and say that is a failure of scheduling, I am bound to repeat that failure, whether it be in Haiti, Nicaragua, or Rwanda. And creating a culture of, I believe, creating a culture of open, honest discussion and debate is the one thing that can really make us a forward-looking organization and I think a forward-looking sector. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor and um, take some questions. Carolyn, does that sound okay? Uh, Okay. I just had a question um, from from Dirk Boma. How do we deal with unengaged basins? Uh, that's a great question. I believe Dirk is, discuss, is considering the fact that we have very minimal hydrologic kinds of information going into most of these projects. Uh, we don't have the USGS with rain gauges telling us how much rainfall exactly, uh, and also catchment area is kind of a stab at best in any of the areas where we work. Um, so we do it in two ways. We do go get rainfall data and we do um, use TechRAS and um, pretty much TechRAS in order to do models of the cross-section. So if you're reducing cross-section, uh, cross-sectional area, you're going to expect an increase in velocity flow. So you're going to want to have an increased freeboard, which is the distance between the high water and the lowest part of the bridge. Um, but a lot of it is just being incredibly conservative. If we expect the water to have, you know, a height of X, we're going to put on 10 feet, uh, you know, a three-meter uh, freeboard. And that's a lot has much to do with our lack of information. Um, okay, great. So Jared asked, how much correspondence with people are you serving? Is there during the design process? And how does that contact change the plans along the way? Um, we have an incredible amount of contact. Uh, we have, in every country where we work, we do have full-time staff, uh, which includes your, your expatriate uh, program manager, but more importantly, all the folks that actually are building these projects are local, um, whether they be out of capital city or provincial capital. But they're living and working in these environments. And during the design phase, it's a, it's a critical stage. Do you guys need steel deck? Do you need wood? Um, what kinds of technologies are you guys currently using in construction? What kinds of materials are, you, are most available? And um, the, what is the highest level uh, experience and comfort level with each of those materials? So we take that very seriously. And that's why when I was talking about that kind of the SIA bridge, um, that's what we call a skeleton. So from the design side, we know, you know, the amount of bending, the amount of shear, how loads we're looking at. But we have the ability to trade out all sorts of different kinds of uh, materials to be locally appropriate. And oftentimes, it's our local guys that are making those decisions. Um, uh, Avery, can I just uh, uh, interrupt you a moment? Um, Oh, okay. If you have questions for Avery, would you please type them in the Q&A box below the chat box? 
And we have one question in now that you're speaking about bridges, Avery, that one of our participants doesn't understand why those wooden towers uh, were inferior to the steel ones since it probably is just as heavy to erect the steel ones as the wood ones. Great question. Um, and in fact, wood is considerably heavier per um, amount of strength in axial loading. So you're looking at having uh, you know, a steel beam, um, we probably need a six inch diameter of a typical HSS tube or, or pipe. That might give you a thousand pounds uh, per tower set. So the same amount of axial load for that same amount of shear bending, uh, you're looking at probably three to four times as heavy of a structure for wood for the same strength requirement. Interesting. Fascinating, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, another question. Um, how is this whole thing working? Do you use volunteer designers? And, and how do you, you know, get involved in those things? Sure. Um, so we rely heavily on the bridge engineering sector primarily here in the United States. Uh, we also have some support in Europe and in Asia. Um, but we're pulling on guys from, you know, let's say it's PCL or Flatiron Construction, Carson Springer Hoff or, or Arup, TY Lynn, um, all kinds of folks that I believe are kind of the industry best here in the United States. And we ask them to help us develop our designs from mainly the technology design side. So then on the other side of it is that we take teams into the field to help us prototype some of those first design iterations. Um, for every bridge that we are doing something new, we require to have structural and contractor experts that can be on site to help us through the process and train our local staff. Um, thereby, after usually we try to do at least three of those bridges, local folks are able to replicate those structures um, without us. So a little bit of we're trying to lead by example, but we also certainly can't afford nor do we want to have the world's best bridge engineers paid on staff. <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you get buy-in from local people? That's a great question. Um, so buy-in question is really goes back down to the local level. Um, each of our program managers in each country really are their own boss. Um, so they work um, with their staff in country and figure out, you know, when are we going to look at 47 projects in Bolivia in the push on the region last year, for example. And there ended up being three that were selected. Um, there's technical viability issues, there's certainly there's mainly social conditions, um, but a big first parameter of us selecting a bridge site is that that has already gone through the channel to request. So we almost always are at the point where we're working with the municipality, and the municipality or the government structure is saying, here's where we want to have our bridges built. We just don't have the resources or technology to do that. Um, again, about capacitation and supporting that local system instead of coming in and fighting it. Um, so by the time they've taken us to their 47 highest gain sites and we've picked the three, a big, huge part of that three is that the community is willing and able to provide leadership and support and volunteer labor on those structures. What happens if the local community does not pick the best site uh, for what they want to build? So that's part of that, that question process. Yeah, so the, oftentimes, you know, they want it here at point X, and the real quality place to do it might be a half mile upstream. Um, and sometimes that half mile upstream is an infinitely more secure structure space, uh, especially when you're considering infrastructure, you've got to think in terms of decades, not years. And so rivers will move, and erosion will happen. Um, so a big piece is when we have our technical staff in country going and doing the site surveys, is to really speak articulately um, and knowledgeably about where are the best types of sites and to explain that in a way that the local community leaders that are helping us to identify the site are able to take us to the best areas. Um, and they know that if we can't find a viable site, we simply will not build in that area. Good. I have a very different kind of question, Avery. Uh, do you think regional training or education centers would help organizations that are involved in these kinds of activities? I definitely do. Um, I think that I'm very biased here, but I believe a, a huge amount of our efficiency is due to the fact that we do work within a country, typically only in a region. 
uh, or two regions, and we spread from there. And then our training centers that we ourselves host, usually with local universities and often with local municipal engineering um, sectors. Um, really, it, it things change region to region. Uh, I believe a lot of the programs that are going on right now, like Engineers Without Borders, for example, um, taking people down uh, into countries and um, you know, typically kind of a in and out kind of approach, you know, coming in, flying in, then leaving, coming in, flying in, leaving. I think that there could be a focus on training as a big deliverable part of each project and program. We would be really helping to support the development of the experts right there in country, both for project maintenance, but also for replication. Hmm. Interesting. Um, another different kind of question. How does the country sign in with you in order to get considered for in-country staff? Ah, good question. Um, strategically, we, we try, we're trying to limit our geographic expansion at this point, uh, just because we've been inundated, if you think of it that way. And uh, we need to make sure we have our support and our structure in place. But if there's an existing program or organization or group of folks that has a, a bridge program request, uh, coming through us, we do have a matrix of kind of making those decisions. The you know, viability of us to have good partners is the number one reason we would decide to go into a country. Um, our biggest successes have been when governments and or other nonprofits have invited us in and have had a planned program where we are to be there for several years, train them, and then we are to leave, uh, to leave our expat staff leave, and we support them on the back end. Interesting. So, Here's another opportunity. Um, one of our uh, participants wants to help some young volunteers who may not have much experience with international development prepare for a project abroad. She was wondering if you could recommend a way to introduce the idea of failure in international development. Yeah. Um, we asked that for this on how old the students are. Is that possible? Not. I'm going to take a stab here. Um, let's assume that they're college-age students. I think. In my experience, um, there's an equal amount of importance that needs to be placed on any kind of technical or uh, construction types of activities that are going to happen, but the cross-cultural preparation is, is essential. Um, before taking anyone abroad, I'm going to assume they're college age, uh, oftentimes there's this deliverable. We're going to do this, we're going to accomplish this, we're going to go here, and we're going to go home. And Whereas that's a really American great way to look at doing work, um, I think the bigger mission certainly is that exposure. And if, especially a young person who hasn't maybe experienced this kind of a work environment before, or even traveled in this environment before, I believe opening oneself up to experience and to be vulnerable um, to the point that I'm very uncomfortable and I'm learning something. And this was really different for me or that food really was this, or that person looking at me like that made me feel it this way. Um, those are the kinds of questions that you as a leader, I believe, can can ask your students and to actively engage with them. And I think that their experience in the long run will be much more profound and long-lasting. Uh, one more question. How sustainable are your designs and projects? What evidence supports the sustainability of what's being done? Sure. So I'll take a stab again. What is sustainability? Is a great question. Um, for us, you know, we're looking at robust design structures. So, in terms of a bridge failing, the only one we've ever had fail is the one that I mentioned in my presentation. So that steel structure being washed out, not from someone. Um, but what we're trying to accomplish is really to have quite a bit of redundancy in all of our design components. So. For example, if you can see on this bridge right here in the background, there are two cables grouped together at every cable point. So one cable having an issue, you have a second one that's redundant. Um, with your anchors, you're making those oversized to the two nose factors of safety of two or greater in assuming fully saturated conditions. And those materials that are likely to fail more quickly, i.e. the decking, um, are easily replaceable, and there's a plan and a training program that's left in place to ensure that those deck panels can indeed be replaced. Um, 
So I would argue our structures themselves are very sustainable. 100% of the structure can be built in replication in the country with no help from us. Um, from those of you that are familiar with my organization, know that we do, in fact, ship in cables. Um, and we do ship in steel pipe. And the reason for that is that we have those materials donated. So at cost, we are saving essentially 50% of our program budget. And that includes the people that we train, whether they're organizations we train, municipalities that we train, locals that we train. If they're willing to go through our quality control and quality assurance program, we're able to donate those materials for cable and steel to them without cost, thereby reducing their their um, their project costs to a point where all of a sudden projects that may not have been financially viable before now are. Um, but I believe that actually is also a very sustainable model um, because we do have donors here in the states that believe the cost of shipping is um, is well spent, and they support that individually beyond our other funding sources. Very interesting. One question from a different perspective. What's the constraining the scope of your operations? Funds, staff, contacts with other countries? There's so much need out there. What's your biggest constraint? Great question. Um, you know, I, I'd say at this point, it is, it's going to be our ability to scale our operations has been a very small organization. We are intentionally very, very lean. Uh, we ran at just over 10% of administration last year. Um, for those of you in the nonprofit sector, that's pretty incredible, I believe. Um, but because of that, we haven't been able to put into place all the operational procedures to really make us scalable in a big way in order to get, let's say, aid funding or um, to work with some of the bigger contractors. So that's something we're currently working on. We have uh, kind of shifted around our organizational structure and have a new director of operations who I believe will make us uh, more scalable and certainly be able to grow more sustainably, but we do things a little bit more slowly at Bridges, make sure we're doing that intentionally. So, I guess money and structure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions at this point. Uh, anybody has a last question for Avery? But I guess we're ready to wrap up. And we really thank you, Avery. This has been very interesting. Thanks, Carolyn. I appreciate everyone's attendance today. And feel free to email me um, if any, any other questions come up. Okay. And uh, there's uh, several websites uh, on the screen that show you how to contact Engineering for Change. And if you forget how to find Avery, I'm sure they can put you in touch with her. So thank you all for attending, and have a good day or evening, as the case may be.